like to start with a, a question for each and every one of you. Some of you may have attended the last session, hopefully, and we want you to, in the chat, list one thing you've done differently since you attended the last webinar. And if you did not have the opportunity to uh, attend the last web webinar, then if you could please answer in the chat, what have you done differently since you learned about this topic? Thank you for joining us to discuss part two of students with disabilities, substance misuse, and incarceration. Consequences of substance misuse for people with learning disabilities should be a concern for all of us. And today we're gonna to discuss some inclusive strategies that schools, parents, youth, and preventionists can use when delivering substance misuse prevention services for students with disabilities in a system where they have been overlooked and at some point even written off. Next slide. The opinions expressed in this presentation do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. Please remain muted unless you are asked to open your mic and also ask that you use the chat for questions. Presentation slides will be available after the presentation. You will be notified. An evaluation will follow this presentation and we need your participation for our development and your certificate of participation, which will be sent to you via email as well by next week. Next slide. These are our learning objectives for today. You'll get the opportunity to explore these in depth. We'll explain why special measures must be taken and describe best practices, and also help you identify some promising equitable approaches to improve services for students with disabilities. You will get the opportunity to let us know how well we met these objectives in your evaluation. Next slide. My name is Derek Newby, and I'm a TTA specialist for region six of the PTTC. And I'll be responding to you in the chat as needed, as well as my team members, Wanda Hudson and Lori Smith. Today, we will continue our conversation about learning disabilities in our education system. We'll discuss how the socio-ecological model can help us organize the levels of awareness around approaches to design strategies, including family, partnerships, community approaches, organizational approaches, and even policy work. You should be able to take what you learn here and apply it to the work that you do. All of these steps will include evidence-based practices and those that could be used and some that are being used already. Next slide. Chuck Lester will lead us into this discussion today a dynamic and inspiring prevention professional. And Chuck serves as a grant manager with OSU Community Wellness Programs for Payne, Pawnee, Noble, Osage, and K counties in Oklahoma. In this capacity, he works with local stakeholders to reduce the consequences of substance misuse across the region throughout the use of evidence-based and environmental strategies. For the past five years, Chuck served as the region's Strategic Prevention Framework Coordinator. Chuck is an inspiration to us all, and I'm honored to have him and his esteemed colleagues, Dr. Michelle Warren and Melinda Caldwell with us today. Without further ado, I ask Chuck to enlighten us. Thank you, Derek. I, I will do my best on the enlightenment part. I have a, a lot of help from my friends today that I'm, I'm very uh, happy to have, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, I thank you again for the opportunity to do this. Um, it is always an, an honor to come and talk to folks both in uh, prevention world and beyond um, with the PTTC um, programs that we put together. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to run it back a little bit to part one, because I think it's so important how this sort of came to be. Um, I got a call from Derek, who had previously had a conversation with LaShonda, one of his colleagues, where 
as preventionists do, they were trying to figure out what are the things that we might be missing. And it's one of the things that I love about our field, that we know that we may not know at all. Um, and we also know that just because we get a population in a room or we make a connection that Maybe there's a chance to dig even deeper into that connection, into that population to figure out where the sort of nesting or hidden populations are. So Derek called me and he said, you know, we we have an idea. We'd like uh, we'd like to talk to you about putting together a presentation on the special education of prison pipeline and the room tilted. I, I described it, I think, the first time as, you know, when you or going in a car and you go over a big bump and that sort of feeling when your stomach drops out from underneath because folks, I will be completely honest, I was completely unprepared for those words to come out of his mouth. It was not something that I felt like I, I knew about. Even previous experience that I had had as a Head Start Center site manager, I was not aware of this connection. So I immediately um, started to dig um, Derek and LaShonda shared the things that they had found and what they had come across was startling. So one of the very first graphics that we came up across indicated that almost 70% of inmates in our federal and state prisons identify as having a disability, 70%. That is a staggering number. Um, in addition, uh, there are the things that you might think of bipolar, depression, anxiety that are most commonly reported, but just behind those are learning disabilities and ADHD. And importantly, a full 25% of the inmates reported that they had at some point in time in their life been enrolled in special education. This makes them very overrepresented in the population as a whole, as you can imagine. So, you know. We started to figure out that there were these gaps, right? The things that I didn't know that um, were concerning because this was obviously a piece where you start to ask the question, well, where is prevention in all this? What are we doing to look at this? Because not surprisingly, there's a strong link to substance use disorder. Um, adolescents with uh, intellectual disabilities and behavioral disturbances are it turns out in the literature at a much higher risk for substance use disorders compared to their non-disabled peers. Youth involved in the legal system identified as eligible for special education at three to seven times the rate of those outside. And although the rate of special education in the juvenile justice system has varied markedly by state, all the way from 9.1% on the low end to 775 on the high end, once you adjust for those numbers, it becomes obvious that special education um, represents over twice the rate observed in the general population. So there were some hard questions in that to ask about where prevention is and where we have been. Um, you know, one of the things that came up in that first um, session was one of the things that Dr. Warren shared, who you'll hear from later, we have these grand ideas. And in this case, one of the grand ideas, and again, as a, as a former center site manager at a Head Start, I have seen this work. The idea of the integrated classroom where you have disabled youth next to their typically developing peers, I have seen the positive benefits um, in both populations. So the disabled youth benefit from having typically developing peers around, typically developing peers have a great benefit to having disabled youth in the classroom with them. So no more of the days of having disabled youth stashed somewhere back behind the, the back stairwell where nobody sees them in a classroom all day. That's a positive thing. It's a grand idea to integrate. It turns out that we haven't necessarily accounted for some of the social realities that exist when you integrate and put vulnerable youth in with typically developing youth. And that's really one of the places where we want to start is to start as prevention, to listen to these other sectors. So one of the things that it brought to mind for me as I thought about these sort of three broad things that we know exist, we know we've got three broad sectors and we'll look at a lot of the other sectors that exist, but for sure in this particular triangle, we've got prevention, we've got education and we've got families that are all sort of working together, but sometimes quite siloed. And it reminded me of the idea of triangulation from 
way back in the day when I went to forestry camp, this idea that out in the wilderness, we have these fire watchtowers that sit up high and as far as their eye can see, whatever their horizon is, they're able to spot where a fire is. And as long as we have three of them that have points of contact that are far enough out, wherever those intersect, when you draw all three circles, that's exactly where the fire is. But it occurred to me as I read the statistics and I started to, to dig into this, that what we have is what you see on your screen now, this idea of there may be some interaction between the, the three sectors, but basically we have this giant hole in the middle, all these cracks where people can fall through and end up incarcerated um, because we maybe haven't broadened our horizon enough. So today we're gonna do what prevention does. We want to increase our capacity. We wanna build our tower taller so that it looks more like this. And the first thing you'll notice is that it co cuts down that hole in the middle. But the second thing is we've expanded more into the idea of being able to collaborate with families, with education, with educators. And so hopefully by doing that, we'll be able to help them build their tire higher, high, tower higher. That's tough to say. And then uh, with education, we increase all of our opportunities for collaboration. Um, and we increase the idea that there are no cracks for anybody to fall through. So triangulation is simply an approach used by many different people who share one thing in common broadly, any similar operation for finding a position or location by means of bearings from two fixed points. We know what we do, but we need to expand our horizons. And that really, really begins by making connections and listening. So, and I'll get to that in, in just a second. I, I wanna say one last thing is sort of the way of refreshing where we're at because it's very important. In the list of all the different disabilities that we deal with, um, there are two that come up in the literature over and over again as having an increased vulnerability. And it goes back to this idea of the sort of grand idea, right? We know from the statistics that people that identify with as having an emotional disturbance or an intellectual disability bearing, bear more of the disease load for substance abuse than their peers do. A cross-sectional study with participants from 14 different countries found that people with an intellectual disability experience SUD rates five times higher than their peers. Uh, so it's very highly correlated with an increased risk of SUD. And a lot of this comes from the fact that we have integrated them into a classroom and into a social environment where they are more likely to have influence from their peers. So they start drinking and using substances at an earlier age due to that peer influence. I did want to go over real quickly that in order to qualify for special education, just again, so we revisit this, an IEP team must determine that a child has a disability in one of 13 categories. So we get spectrum disorder, deaf, blind, deafness, emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, multiple disabilities, orthopedic disabilities, health impairment, speech and language, traumatic brain injury, learning disabilities, and vision. But the two that we really want to highlight for our work in prevention as it relates to substance use is an emotional disturbance, which is a condition exhibiting one or more of the following characteristics over a long period of time. An inability to learn that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors and be and an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships. Again, those sort of peer relationships and see inappropriate types of behaviors or feelings under normal circumstances, general pervasive mood or unhappiness, and a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personnel or school problems. And then an intellectual disability, which is significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning existing concurrently with deficits in adaptive behavior and manifested during the developmental period that adversely affects a child's educational performance. So by way of review, that's kind of where we're at. In today's model, we're gonna talk about the ecological model a lot. And I'm imagining that a lot of us have seen this, especially those in prevention, but this model, both in its shape and the way that it's this layered idea of concentric circles that ever expand out was too good not to use for today. In addition to the fact that it hits a lot of the high points for where we're at, um, you know, it's important to note in this 
policy that as you work up, first of all, you'll notice that this inner ring, the individual, that is currently where we place a lot of the burden um, in this sort of idea. We get services to an individual, maybe we get an, uh, services to an individual family, and then they are largely responsible, as you'll hear from our parent um, that's going to speak later for their growth and, and whatever. It rarely scales up to community and societal in, in a positive way. And in fact, if you look at the societal ring, we're going to talk a lot about laws and policies, but it also includes things like culture and historical trauma. And that's important because we know there's, again, in the idea of this nested population, not only do we see the disparity that exists between typically developing peers and the disabled, but that also then acts doubly as a multiplier for our students of color. Researchers found that 26% of black students received at least one suspension for a minor infraction over the course of three years compared with just 2% of white students. That's even more pronounced with the treatment of males and people of color with a disability. So that larger ring as we start to expand these out, we wanna think sort of at that higher and higher level because that's how we start to expand those horizons and get our towers up to the point where we can be better served to help everybody and make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. To do that, and as I said, when I got that call, um, it was a real eye-opener and a real moment almost of panic. So I reached out to people that I knew I could trust um, because I wanted to learn more about the family's experience and the school's experience with this. So I did a lot of asking questions. I did a lot of listening. At the end of the day, that's one of the things that prevention should be doing best, going to people, trying to make connections and listening and learning. Um, so. I would like to introduce, to take a look at these sort of first two rings, my esteemed colleague, Melinda Caldwell. She has a master's in public health with the concentration in rural and underserved populations from Oklahoma State University. And for the past eight years, she's filled several roles with us at OSU Community Wellness across several different grants. She has experience working with our healthy living programs, which look to prevent the onset of cardiovascular disease and reduce tobacco use. She's also worked on community-based substance abuse prevention grants, and she currently heads our effort to increase HIV testing rates in rural Oklahoma. So as you can tell, Melinda wears a lot of hats. But the most important one of these that she wears is her role as a mom to three amazing kiddos, one of which was born with a disability. As a family, they've been navigating the often difficult path of trying to get the best possible outcomes for their daughter and entire family. The at minute I heard, I asked her the day I got the call if she'd be willing to share her unique perspective as, as a preventionist and a mom of a disabled child. And I'm humbled to say that she said yes without hesitation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Melinda Caldwell. Thank you, Chuck, for that introduction. Um, and as he mentioned, again, my name is Melinda Caldwell and my daughter Olivia is four years old and was diagnosed with Joubert syndrome at six months of age. And to give a little bit of background on um, her uh, diagnosed disability, Joubert syndrome is a neurological genetic condition that causes the underdevelopment of the cerebral vermis or the hindbrain, which is the area of the brain that really controls balance and coordination. And due to her condition, um, Olivia is developmentally delayed, um, and she began walking at around four, four years of age and is currently nonverbal. Um, she currently receives PT, OT, speech, vision, music, and warm water therapy through the schools that she's attending. And so upon receiving Olivia's diagnosis, our entire world completely changed. And navigating this new journey was really, um, I equate it to teaching a child to swim by throwing them in the water um, without support and just hoping that the child's instincts would take over. And we continued to try to keep our head above water for quite a while as we navigated this new landscape um, with our family, really just taking one step at a time and faced a multitude of barriers while advocating for Olivia and trying to navigate resources. But I wanna highlight one of the largest contributors to overcoming those barriers was really the social networks that we were able to establish with other families and those who had already gone through those same experiences that we were experiencing when Olivia was diagnosed. So I wanna tell a quick story of one of the barriers that we faced. Um, pretty early on, um, 
when Olivia was transferring off of her IFSP and onto an IEP within um, the local school system. So we um, lived in a rural community in rural Oklahoma, and we were going into our first IEP meeting in which um, we were excited to have this conversation with the school of these services and how they can best support Olivia. And we were then met with um, some news that we weren't quite expecting from um, this small rural school that they felt after having a conversation about Olivia's needs that it may be best for us to look at transferring her or moving to a nearby larger school district um, for her to get the full support and services that um, that larger school district could really um, network and, and have in place that some small rural schools just may not have the capability of providing. And so thankfully, after going home and having a conversation with my husband, we um, had the support in place to be able to move our family to that um, larger school district. However, as preventionists, we know this is not always the case. And not all families have the support systems in place to be able to make that move. So I really want you to think of this is just one barrier of my experience, but families face multiple barriers. And what happens when a child's family um, maybe doesn't have the support to move? And so they're left with their kiddo um, starting out their educational journey, maybe not receiving all of the full resources um, in place to aid in their success in school. And so prior to entering our new, our second IEP meeting within this larger school district, we were able to have some time to think and reflect on that experience. And we were able to confide in and gain support from a network of families um, who had already gone through that process before. And really, they were able to share their, under their understanding of IEP language to us. So we were gaining that information from a trusted source and really how to advocate services, which helped build um, confidence for us as parents when we entered into that second meeting. And as we continued our journey with Olivia, social support really continued to play a critical role in our family's ability to advocate for our child. Um, networking with other families really lent this feeling of comfort, reassurance, and understanding. And this opportunity for connection and mutual understanding was really foundational as we continued on as Olivia's caregivers. And I wanna highlight this definition from Dr. Edward Hallowell, who is a psychiatrist um, of connectedness. So Dr. Hallowell states that um, his def he defines connection as feeling a part of something larger than yourself, feeling close to another person or group, feeling welcomed and understood. And I wanna highlight the word understood here because as a mother um, of a child with a diagnosed IDD, this is a key sticking point in creating a safe space for family connections and partnerships with schools and prevention professionals really helps to build trust and can aid in that collaborative approach to identify local risk and protective factors to begin to address public health problems. So next slide. So as we look at the triangulation that Chuck mentioned of family, education, and prevention, and current evidence-based models to aid in this collaboration, um, we want to um, take a closer look at the communities of that care model. And so the Communities That Care CTC model is an evidence-based community change process for reducing youth problem behaviors, which can include harmful substance use. And utilizing the CTC model to build a coalition of families of students on an IEP can really assist schools and prevention professionals in addressing and mitigating future adolescent health and behavior problems through looking at these risk and protective factors. Um, so implementation of CTC is organized into five stages um, with the first steps, including recruiting relevant stakeholders. And in this case um, would be the parents of children on an IEP. So there are different ways that you can go about recruiting these parents. Um, the first would be already looking at the parents that um, have a child within the schools on an IEP, really figuring out who those gatekeepers are within the school system, where parents are already getting that communication and using those channels. Um, secondly, reaching out to your state's early intervention program professionals. Um, in your area and making them aware of this opportunity for parents so they can share this information as their child ages out of the IFSP process and into the school system. 
building relationships with local therapists and doctor's offices to serve that serve school age children with IDDs may be another outlet. And some of these professionals may already be sitting on your coalitions. And then lastly, checking with the local and statewide nonprofits and networks that aim to service children with disabilities. Um, these groups often already have trust built with these families and can aid in the dissemination of this information in your area. So very briefly, the next steps of the CTC are developing governance structures to guide decision making, developing a community profile from local data and assessments, creation of a community action plan, and then finally implementation and evaluation. So best practice would suggest representation from families and children on an IEP to best guide this work. And I'm sure as prevention professionals, many of you are already implementing some form of this practice into your work, but I really wanna highlight that it is imperative that as prevention professionals, we take the time to make sure that family is um, being representative of the service population you're looking to, to serve with your programs and um, implementation, as well as taking the time to pause and listen to their stories and understand the hardships they face before beginning implementation of a program or evidence-based practices. And engaging and retaining families in prevention programs is critical um, to ensure maximum public health impact. So family involvement um, helps to facilitate children's cognitive, social, and emotional functioning and has been linked to increased self-esteem, improved behavior, and more positive attitudes towards school. And in addition, um, research has also shown that adolescents are less likely to engage in high-risk behaviors when they perceive a strong connection between their home and school. So I wanna take a closer look of what the CTC model looks like in practice when connecting families to coalitions. So we know that having families represented at broader community coalition meetings, as well as parent-led coalitions, not only helps to build that social support among families, but also to rebuild trust within the current systems they navigate, such as the educational system. And listening to parents may also give preventionists a clearer framework, a clearer framework of how to best advocate, educate, and support the policies um, to best serve service the needs of these families. Um, so the CTC model contains scientifically driven programming for school, community, and family interventions. And I want to look at specifically an evidence-based family intervention program of CTC titled FAST, or the Families and Schools Together um, program. And these are designed to really strengthen family relationships and increase cohesion, engage parents more with the school, and enable them to advocate for their children's edu education while connecting families to other families and community resources. This can help to reduce isolation and stress among the parents and families. So these, these programs are typically run at a school. Um, it could also occur within the community and they meet for weekly sessions, often over an eight week period with two interventions per year. Um, and then during these sessions, families get to share time together and they get to bond over so shared experiences and really create that social support network that can help guide them as they um, kind of move through the educational system. So I would like to end by reiterating how this parental hub can then assist preventionists in building a network to address the needs, share resources, and most up-to-date research regarding children, regarding children on IEPs. And then as well as pre with preventionists, parents' abilities to participate in these public health efforts, to advocate for their child while gaining connection to other parents is absolutely critical and a needed resource for caregivers. And then finally, I really want to leave this group um, with a challenge of challenging prevention and school professionals to really look to capitalize on this strategic opportunity um, to capture parental insight when addressing public health issues. I was gonna mention at the top, thank you, Melinda, but we do wanna take some time after each one of our presenters to let you all ask some questions. So just a couple of moments here, if you wanna drop questions in the chat box, if you have specific questions about any of the material that Melinda covered or um, any questions just in general for her. And thank you, Michelle, as well, for dropping in the chat the definitions of IFSP as well as IEP. All right. Any questions for Melinda? Don't worry. Oh, we have one. Okay. Have you seen prevention programs who work inside schools, 
successfully imp implement this in rural communities? So how might this look in rural communities? Have we seen it? I have not currently seen this in practice. And um, Michelle, with your um, with your work in schools, I'm not sure if you've seen this as well, but the great thing about the FAST model is um, it's up to 60% adaptable um, while being evidence-based. So I think this is something that doesn't necessarily require a lot of resources and that um, a rural school may be lacking sometimes those resources. So I think it would be really easy to implement um, and to help gain that social support for families as they move forward and really to help to bridge that connection with school and, and families and then bring in the prevention as well. Michelle, do you want to, to share? I have some ties from the things that you presented into what that might look like in the school setting. So if we can pause on that question, I think we'll address it here in just a few minutes. Perfect. Awesome. And I also will be following up with that idea of uh, adaptation too. So. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. We're gonna move along for one for you now. Um, so um, just where we're at, what evidence practices do you currently use that connect families and schools? We'd like to sort of pick your brain a little bit and get an idea of what you already may be doing that might be successful and a chance to share with everybody um, in, in the presentation today. So again, what um, evidence-based practices are you currently using or do you know about even, if even if you're not using it, but you're interested in it and you've read about it that connect families and schools? All right, well, that is actually kind of a, a good segue um, into what I'm gonna talk about a little bit next. And that is this idea, um, as Melinda just said, and really, all through today, you're going to be hearing a lot. You know, if we spent the first, um, if we spent the first session kind of highlighting the problem and illustrating where there might be cracks in the system, what we wanted to do this time was start to present some ideas of again how we can expand those horizons. But one of the things that you find anytime you have a problem that maybe hasn't been covered yet, and we saw this um, in the case of the meth. Um, epidemic the first time around, or the opioid epidemic, where there weren't necessarily evidence-based programs in place that you could go to. And so one of the things that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about today is from a prevention standpoint, this is one of those areas, now that we know that it's an issue, and now that we know sort of the mountain that we have to climb, this is one of those where we want to have a solid practice in place for trying to find promising practices and not being afraid to adapt those evidence-based programs with fidelity. I think a lot of times we know this is an option for us, but we maybe get caught in the idea of trying to match fidelity or, or trying to make it too perfect. I found this model um, actually from the University of Texas School of Social Work, and even though it's sort of client and clinical based, I loved the idea that they were really thinking of evidence-based practice as a process. Um, so they were discussing it as something that just needs to happen as a matter of course, and that you are always adapting and trying to figure these things out so that as, as uh, Melinda brought up with the FAST program, 60% adaptable, you know, give it a shot and see if it works. Use this model. So their model starts with asking the question. And again, that goes along well with everything that we're saying today. From a prevention standpoint, we want to ask those questions and listen and learn, figure out where they are, um, understand their circumstances. And then we're going to acquire knowledge. We're going to do what we, one of the things that we do best, we're going to research, dig in, figure out where there are other places that have one-off programs that have worked, or maybe early things that represent promising practices, but aren't fully in evidence yet, or evidence-based programs that already exist for either a different population or um, a, a problem that we're not specifically looking at, but you think, um, and that's where we start to get into three, you're using your, and it says in the model clinical experience, but our field experience as preventionists is valuable. That's the filter that you really want to put this through. If you have a suspicion, if it sort of you hear the model and you think in the back of your brain, like, you know what that might actually be really good for, 
you want to start to investigate whether you think that might represent a good evidence-based strategy or something to try. You apply the best choice and then analyze and adjust is just another way for us to talk about the evaluation that we always do to see if things work. And then you adjust it until eventually you either have an evidence-based program that works or you have one that you know you need to move on down the road and try something else. But I think one common theme you'll find in today's um, presentation, whether it's FAST and CTC as it relates to developing those sort of parent coalitions or what Michelle will talk about with community-based schools, a lot of these are in theory, really good practice and evidence base, and they have some evidence base, but it takes somebody willing to adapt those ideas first. So I just, I want to really sort of reiterate that, um, highlight it, because that's one of those places where prevention can sort of drive the train a little bit. So we wanted to move up the line here. So we've talked about the first two rings, the individual and the families, parents, teachers. Um, how do we expand our horizons in the community? Well, a lot of us are already doing community work, right? We have community coalitions. But, you know, importantly, as Melinda just said, sometimes when we get sectors at those communities, we don't, are those community coalition tables, we don't often stop to think about how many sectors one person might represent. Sure, they might be the vice mayor, or they might be the police chief, but they are also families. They are also maybe involved with their church. They have lots of different hats that they could wear. So especially and specifically, as we talk about this idea of disrupting the special education to prison pipeline, how do we expand our horizons here? And for me, um, it started in the same way. I knew that I needed to learn. I, I needed to, to find somebody who was living this, who was professionally savvy in this. I needed to ask them some questions and be able to assess and learn along with them. So I did exactly that. I reached out to a uh, professional in the field and talked to them. And one of the things that became sort of apparent was when we think about this idea of com the, our community approach, you know, we always talk about making sure that you've got the right people at your table. Who are the right people? Making sure that if we're talking about healthcare, we have healthcare at the table. If we're talking about education, it's important, obviously, to have families at the table, but it's very important to have educators and people who understand that world at the table. And then to remember right, that as we look at this landscape and think back to our model that has the three sort of segments, prevention, family, education, that really all of these folks represent one big piece that is not represented in our model here, um, often because it's poorly defined and it's nowhere in law. And that's the idea of family. Nowhere do we have a formal definition because we all know that families can be biological families, they can be adopted families, they can be found families, but we really need to work in our coalitions and in this community approach to understand that everybody has a piece of this. Um, it's a critical piece of the puzzle because the relationship with schools and the way that education plans are deployed uh, are developed mean that we have to make sure that families are represented in while they're wearing their family hats. Right, we're asking them the specific ways that their families are impacted by these situations, and so again, I reached out to uh, a professional, also a lifelong friend of mine, who is both uh, a mom and an education professional, to be able to kind of talk me through some of the, the um, challenges and the barriers that they face. So. Um, Dr. Michelle Warren, as I said, is a lifelong friend, an accomplished educator who has 18 years of experience working in the public school setting, 16 years of those as a school psychologist in an urban school district, and for the last two years, importantly, um, a school administrator in rural Oklahoma, and it is rural up in Osage County, um, if you're not familiar with it. Um, in that capacity, she serves 
as the Director of Mental Health Services for the Osage County Interlocal Cooperative in Hominy. It's based in Hominy, but they really do work all over Osage County. They provide supervision, support for school-based mental health professionals, including school counselors, school social workers, school psychologists, along with the field-based experiences for graduate students seeking entry into those fields. So they've got some um, interns and, and some GAs that are doing work. The OCIC mental health team supports the implementation of a mental health service provider demonstration grant through the U.S. Department of Education, a state grant through the Department of Education providing school counselors and other school-based mental health providers, and a school-based prevention grant. Importantly, that's one of the hats that Michelle also wears, um, is doing prevention work inside those rural schools through the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Um, Michelle has uh, like I said, 18 years uh, of experience. And I am so grateful that again, when I called, Michelle answered, she talked to me about it and immediately agreed to share her knowledge and her lived experience in this realm with me. So I would like to introduce to you, Dr. Michelle Warren. Thank you, Chuck, for the introduction. Um, just to, to paint a picture of rural schools in Oklahoma, um, we have 14 member school districts that we work with, and our student enrollment ranges anywhere from 59 students in a school district to about 750, um, our average being 150 to 250 students or so. Um, okay, so what I want to do is, because I know most of you guys live and work in the prevention field, I want to create some common language. Uh, so if you, we, we were to talk about prevention terminology, um, and one of my esteemed colleagues has schooled me on all of that because we got lucky to hire somebody who'd worked in prevention who also wanted to be a school counselor. Um, so I've got paired here prevention versus treatment um, terminology. And really in the school setting, we're functioning more in that treatment terminology set. Um, so you, we would commonly refer to this type of model as a multi-tiered systems of support model. The intent of that is that the school team is going to find a way to use the resources that we have to the best of our ability to meet the needs of all of our students. Um, through assessment, we determine specific needs of students um, and identify if we have larger issues. Um, with our universal curriculum within the schools. Ideally, our universal strategies or our tier one strategies should meet the needs of about 80% of our students. That would be our common reading, math, writing, whatever our curriculum is, should meet the needs of approximately 80% of our kids. Um, at our selective or tier two level, we should be addressing about 10 to 15% of our students that require some level of additional support. And that leaves approximately three to 5% of our students that require indicated or tier three interventions where we're gonna be much more intentional about what we're doing. So just like in the SPIF model, in our MTSS model, we also want to be sure that we're engaged in ongoing assessment. We're regularly considering and addressing our our capacity and our abilities to provide the needs for our students, and also then evaluating the effectiveness of our system in, is it effectively meeting the needs of our student population? Do we have more than 80%, more than 10 to 15% of our population that our tier one or universal curriculum is not meeting? If we do, we have an issue, a larger issue, and we need to be addressing that. So while prevention tends to focus on the likelihood of current usage of substances to determine what members of groups should receive what interventions and programs, in school, we're really focusing on the individual child and their ability to participate in school and in both academics and behavior and determine what level of need or services that they require and then building that plan for them. Okay, 
Next slide, please. So when we talk about things that we currently have going in schools, um, we do have three of our school districts that are working with us in a school-based prevention grant. And while I talked about in the first session, legally, schools are not required to address substance abuse. It's not an identified disability under the Individuals with Disabilities Act. Um, but we also know that students in our schools are using substances. Um, and their substance use may be getting in the way of their ability to access their education. So it's best practice for us to consider and address any barriers or things that are getting in the way of students receiving their education. And so addressing substance and prevention, if that's a need in our community, we wanna make sure that we're doing that. So through our school-based prevention grant, um, my team is providing support for prevention activities in our three rural school districts. Um, we review the Oklahoma Needs Prevention Assessment, which is um, up until this coming year, it has been a voluntary participation for grades 6, 8, 10, and 12. Um, the, uh, the upcoming school year, that's going to be mandatory participation for all public school students. But we are using that data to help us then focus on um, the needs within our school districts. So the grant requires that we all focus on activities to reduce substance use, address psychological distress, and then we get to select our third area. Um, and because we have three different school districts, we have multiple <laughs> third areas that we're working with. Um, so to address substance use, at our sites are middle school students, so sixth through eighth grade students, are participating in Botvin learning, life skills training. Um, at some sites, that's been expanded to additional grade levels. Um, in the upcoming school year, we're going to be including some upper elementary schools, so grade three and five. Um, and again, that's at that universal or tier one level. So all of our students in those targeted grades are receiving that service. At all of our sites, still at tier one, um, we are engaging in information dissemination that occurs at least monthly through a newsletter where we provide parents and families tips and information regarding substance use and prevention strategies. And we utilize a newsletter application that allows us to track metrics and um, make sure that that information is getting out to our families. So as we move into that selective or tier two level, one of our school districts targeted area of improvement was they wanted to address student attendance and connection to school. Uh, they had a large chunk of their population that was meeting criteria for being chronically absent. So they were exceeding um, expected participation in school, which is about 90% of your school year. So the team has this year, we've participated in training for Check and Connect Mentor Program, um, and we'll be implementing that in the next school year. We have several staff that have been trained and they'll target specific students um, for that mentoring program. In addition, they've developed a family resource board. So this group meets with students and families of those students who are chronically absent, they're failing courses, and demonstrating, in some cases, discipline concerns. Um, the group is partnering with community agencies to assist with removing barriers for students and families that may be impacting the students' attendance and school participation. So this is our first year to be doing that. The district has addressed the needs of 19 students with this approach. Um, and that represents about 2% of our population because remember my numbers are really small. Um, and then we also are utilizing um, Aspire, which is a program from MD Anderson targeting tobacco usage and alcohol EDU through EverFi. Um, these are both available to our school districts as alternatives to suspension, trying to increase student knowledge so that they make better decisions um, and moving from there. 
So if I look at my, I haven't yet addressed that indicated or tier three level of need um, as the way that my schools are staffed, um, the way that a lot of schools are staffed, this would not necessarily be a service that a school district would address, but they might have partnerships or collaboration with outside community agencies to make sure that the students are receiving the services that they need specific to substance abuse treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this one, I want you to think back to that community approach slide that Chuck had, the big wheel with family in the middle. And instead of family, I want you to plug school in the middle. So how do we bring that community approach into our schools? We can utilize a community schools model where the school becomes the hub of the community, bringing all resources and supports that may benefit students and families into the school setting, utilizing the four pillars that we have listed here. So schools can rely on the resources within the community to meet the needs of students rather than needing to employ those specifically trained staff or fund a given program. We're gonna utilize all of the other tools that we have within our community and allow the school to be the central location for all of those. So when we think about integrated student support, this can include academics. It can include addressing medical needs that are preventing the students from accessing school. That might be a clinic that you find in a local school district with collaboration with medical community. It can address social emotional needs by providing counseling or um, extracurricular activities, addressing mental health. So if we think about substance abuse specifically through this collaboration, Schools can make partnerships with community organizations that can come to the school and provide services directly to the students in need. Um, Melinda spoke specifically about connection, and I really like the quote that she found. And I want to focus on the fact that connection requires that somebody feels welcome and understood. So a lot of our families that have students that have an emotional disturbance or have an intellectual disability or other challenges at schools, oftentimes they come from family members who have also had challenging school experiences. So the school experience is not only a challenge for them in the parenting role, but they're also bringing their own baggage and negative experiences with them that influence how they interact with the school community. So, through activity, through active family and community engagement, schools can work to improve student and family experiences within the schools. This can include bringing community resources with it into the schools for the family, having engaging family nights that aren't the usual parent teacher, here's all the laundry list of the things that are not going well, conversations. We want to make school welcome and supportive to the families, school carnivals, things like that. Um, the other thing we can do is take those two strategies that Melinda specifically spoke to, and for our families of students with disabilities, we can embed those into this model. So we can take the CTC model and or the FAST model and implement them here. If we can have family engaging we're engaging parents of students with disabilities. We can provide support and education opportunities to those families. We can and increase their connection to school. By doing all of those things, we are increasing the likelihood that we're gonna see success with the student, the family, and within the school setting. When we look at that expanded and enriched learning time, um, these are opportunities we often look at as expanding the school day, extending the school day, allowing for more flexibility in the content um, and the activities that we provide. So we're not as limited by curricular requirements of so many minutes of math and so many minutes of reading. Um, we can really embed different opportunities for our students. So we might see this include homework, help and tutoring, fine arts activities, sports, um, and also more experiential learning opportunities. 
So if we had a community where substance use was heavy, we might include a specific prevention um, instruction and opportunities <coughs> to address that need. And then lastly, collaborative leadership and practice. So this goes back to we want to have a shared planning, a shared model for planning, for data analysis. We want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our community because the students that are in our schools, if we think of the of Chuck's wheel of um, the ecological theory, we're touching all of those things. So schools are impacted by policy, schools affect policy. Um, individual students impact the family and then go on to impact the community when they are out and about. So we want to make sure that our schools are meeting the needs of all of our folks because schools are creating our future citizens. So we need our businesses and our community members to be part of that conversation. What do our students need to leave knowing how to do? Um, can we offer internship opportunities and expanded collaboration to make sure that we're producing students that can be functional members of society and support the business needs in the community? All right, so any questions? Did I hope that that answered what that might look like in a rural school, but if you have further questions, let me know. Drop them in the chat and we'll get them asked. Just a couple more seconds here to see. And we will have some questions at the end as well. So if you think of anything in between now and then, um, please feel free to drop those in and we'll get them. All right. So we are going to move again to a little bit of a group discussion. We're going to pick your brains a little bit. So in the next 10 minutes, uh, we're going to facilitate discussion of two questions in some breakout rooms. Don't worry, all the breakout rooms, we've got excellent folks The PTTC does on the back end that take care of all of our tech things. They're gonna get you put into those breakout rooms when you get there. You have a facilitator to kind of talk you through what is your role in preventing substance use disorders in youth with disabilities? And what is an approach that you could take to improve services for students with disabilities? So please, um, have a good, rich discussion on those two ideas, given all the things that we've already talked about today and bringing in your own experience. And then we will have a report back out at the end. Okay, we're back. We're back. Absolutely. Let me get off mute there. We are back. Um, I know we would should have had some folks um, taking some notes. So, and so um, anybody have report outs? from those group sessions, what was uncovered? I'll ask uh, Hannah to open her mic from Family One. All right, so some of the ones that we had come up with uh, was making sure that our own children are aware of the dangers of substance use. Um, also um, making them aware of the uh, prevention of substance use. Um, students encouraging to be a leader of substance use um, prevention and not a follower of substance use, uh, helping raise awareness in our community, educating parents on substance misuse it, so the families can um, start their own coalition if, um, if they wanted to, uh, educating about resources in the community, um, just making sure that everyone is aware of what resources are out there, um, everyone knows awareness, just educating um, everyone on substance misuse. Thank you, Hannah. How about Anna from Prevention 2? Hi, um, Anna with um, Phoenix House. I, uh, uh, one of the things we discussed was, um, well, for one thing that Phoenix House does, uh, we provide adolescent residential treatment uh, services, outpatient services and prevention services. Um, and as far as Abdul uh, Majid, he also would, did work in treatment at one time, but he now does include where he works 
uh, to help those with disabilities. Um, and one of the things that I think that we all wanted to do to work together is to collaborate with other programs and to share some of the ideas that we can, that we don't serve um, and work together as a team and where the needs are needed in the community and for, to provide services and resources. And I think importantly, one of the things that Abdel talked about was he uh, had to sort of do an adaptation. The program that he's teaching isn't necessarily specifically made for folks with disabilities, but he sort of made that choice to, to adapt it. So do we have any other groups, any of the other facilitators have really great points? Maybe one more. Yeah, I can share from our group, Chuck. Um, this is Melinda again. So when uh, discussing um, approaches to improve services for students with disabilities, it seemed to be a common theme among across the different states that were represented in our breakout group um, that the data is lacking. So data among um, substance use of youth within the school system. And um, I'm happy and surprised to say that Oklahoma is on the forefront with this, with Michelle mentioning earlier that we're now mandating our OPNA data, um, but that's not the case in a lot of states. So working with statewide public um, health policy groups to mm -hmm. advocate for mandating data among youth um, and from a prevention and public health standpoint of uh, advocating to legislators of why that's important when we look to implement these programs. And I think that makes a great segue, Melinda, um, because what we're about to start to talk about is the part that I get really excited about. So we've talked about these three um, inner rings, um, the work that we can do to expand our horizons and those and to help them expand our horizons. This last ring, folks, this is where prevention can shine. Um, and, and it's really where we should, because, you know, Michelle mentioned it, a lot of the things that go on just because they have to in schools, in those sort of family relationships, they have to be geared towards the individual. That is who we're trying to help have a successful school outcome. And so the individual is where a lot of this happens, but we know as preventionists in this ecological model that the environment produces behavior, the environment produces the individual, or at least distinctly shapes the individual, right? And this is one of the places where we make these connections all the time. We, we talk about laws and policy. We talk about um, the uh, cultural historical trauma piece. And so this is really the place, and even, you know, mentioning the OPNA, the Oklahoma Prevention Needs Assessment, which I am also very proud of, but I was in uh, my group with a couple of folks from Texas. They do something similar. So they are getting that information. But importantly, especially as it relates to today's deal, guess what? We're not isolating. I don't know that we have a way to tell if a child has been on an IEP when they report out to us or that they are in special education. They are into the aggregate data that we get and we can absolutely draw some conclusions out of that. But it's not the same as being able to get granular with that data and pick it out. So even with that, we have some places where we can do some work. Um, policy affects every level. Michelle said that earlier, the model starting as early as the organizational level, their formal policies, right? Black and white policies that prevention can have a role in making um, or bringing data to, making data informed and evidence-based decisions. Further, there's a mountain of evidence about the power of children feeling securely connected to their school. Um, this is a, a body of work that we mentioned in the first one where if a, if a child feels connected to their school and it, it, it can be the janitor, it can be a coach, it doesn't have to be a teacher, a principal, the, the front office worker, if they can feel a connection to an adult at their school, there is a, an insulating uh, protective factor that they have against 14 of, of some of the 16 worst outcomes that they can have. Um, it's vitally important that that school connection is something that is nurtured. Um, but we know that out of school suspensions on paper, they don't work, but they're still common practice. There's data to prove that they don't work. We also know that children of color receive harsher punishments than their peers. We mentioned that earlier. There is data to back this up. There are policies that guide all of these decisions, every single one of them, that we as prevention can be a vital part of developing in the way that we bring that sort of body of research to things. 
we also know that we can write up an immaculate policy, right? Uh, I do a lot of alcohol work. I've written some alcohol business policies and on paper, they look great. But if in practice, they don't match um, what we see on the ground, then they're not worth the, the paper that they're printed on. You know, if you recall from the last session, the story of Dakota Levine, who as a 15 year old hadn't been allowed to attend a full day of school um, since third grade because of the use of informal removals, this practice of not formally suspending a, a student, but suspending them sort of informally. Um, it was a New York Times piece. Highly encourage you to look that up um, from the first uh, and read it. Um, you know, this is something that is going on all over the place and importantly and very timely, and I think we will be dropping this in the chat and including it as a resource, education uh, educators just received a dear colleague letter from the Department of Education. Hold discouraging. On, well, that yep. letter's from 2016, it's not new. Okay, not new, but they have received a dear colleague letter that informs them of the fact that this is not a practice that matches the, the standard that they're expected to live up to. So we're gonna make sure you have that letter so that you have knowledge of that letter. If you go into schools and you're talking to people in schools and you find out that they are doing um, informal removals, you'll be able to at least refer them maybe to some information and let them know that informal removals are not something that we should be doing at this point. There's a, these are all, uh, a place where the principles of primary prevention can be important contributors, but the key is what we've talked about today in laying the groundwork to, to borrow a line from Hamilton, to be in the room where it happens. Um, there, so it's all back to this. We, we talk a lot about prevention being about the relationships that you make, how you nurture those relationships, how well we listen. That's really where the trick of all of this is. But I do want to point out, it's not always so clear cut. And if we take, for example, a case out of Oklahoma that we mentioned in part one, um, again, thanks to Michelle, a, a case study that came her way. Um, but if we talk about how we get involved in school policy, there are all these pieces that we know from data, but the world changes. And we now live in a world where we have medical cannabis and sometimes recreational cannabis. This comes to us from Oklahoma, a 10 year old student with severe cannabis intoxication to the point where they were not able to function. Um, importantly, as background, Oklahoma law allows for a person under 18 to have a medical use license. The parents were both aware and encouraged use and other districts have incorporated as sort of the solution to this, other districts have found ways to incorporate language regarding level of intoxication into their policy. Well, this is one of those places where there's potential area for prevention work to happen. So on a couple of levels, if we use our socioeconomic or our socioecological model, first of all, with the school, if you know that other school districts um, and you can dig in and, and find out what other school districts are doing to sort of combat this world of like, we have a kid coming to school with a license, with parents who are encouraging use, what do we do? Again, we know that we want them to stay connected to school. We know that we shouldn't suspend them. And we also know that substance use disorder is not necessarily directly covered, right? It's, it's one of those tier three pieces that might be able to re be referred out. Um, what do we do? Where do we start? Um, so, you know, in this case, sharing with the school district what other school districts are doing. That's one place to start um, and really start to figure out, you know, do we need to bring law enforcement officers in to do, to talk about how they recognize signs of intoxication. We have law enforcement officers that receive, you know, drug recognition um, enforcement training that would be able to walk through some of those early indicators and signs from that sort of expertise. Again, using that community wheel where we're pulling from all the different sectors of, of the community to help schools develop these policies that are in line with the data that we know to be best practice. Um, and then the other piece of this, right, starts to get to that bigger picture. Local ordinances, state laws, in this case, do we really need to have eight, under 18 year olds that are medically licensed, that might be a place to look at into contacting our state legislators. And that really gets us to this larger piece. 
And as I started to do um, work on this topic, one of the things that came to light, thanks to Michelle, um, IDEA, which we've mentioned a couple of times, the law that, that governs what schools are to do with people with disabilities, um, it has not been updated since 2004. And importantly, um, as it stands currently, substance use disorder is not on its own a disability recognized in the IDEA Act. ADA rec recognizes it as a disability for adults and schools, as Michelle pointed out last time, absolutely can and, and likely do work with students who, who uh, have a substance use disorder that is diagnosable, but they have to use a 504 um, under ADA, which means they get no funding, they don't get a lot of resources to be able to, to do anything with it. And so a lot of times this ends up being them doing turnkey things. Um, this is a huge lift, but it's a lift that I believe prevention could do to look at some of the laws that guide substance abuse disorders, not just as they relate, honestly, to, to kids with an intellectual disability or emotional disturbance, those as we've talked about, we need to pay special attention to because we know they are more susceptible than any of their peers to develop substance use disorders, but just across the board to make sure that schools have the resources in place to be able to address substance use disorder and early onset use of substances as their own sort of disability if it impacts the child's behavior, if it impacts their school performance. Um, those sort of areas of state law, federal law, local policy, that's where prevention can really dig in and be the leader um, as, it, as it relates to students with disability and trying to disrupt this pipeline. And I really hope, um, in addition to this idea of reaching out to your school sectors, um, your family sectors, that we really start to look at some of the policies that are guiding us um, currently in special education, especially as special education relates to the onset of substance use disorder. So our next steps, uh, I think each of our presenters um, sort of has some takeaways that they wanna make sure that they share. I'll open it to Melinda first to share hers. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. So really, um, with the information that I shared today for public health professionals, really just wanting to ensure that the family sector is represented and supported, and most importantly, given a voice in public health coalitions you attend. So I urge that as you go back and, and leave today's um, webinar, you really think about the coalitions you attend and the coalition meetings you hold, and is that family sector representative, rep representative of the target population you're looking to serve? Are they at the table, and are you giving them a voice to share their perspective? And for school professionals here today, um, consider implementing the evidence based programming, whether it's FAST or another evidence-based program um, to engage parents of students with disabilities. And again, allowing them to have a voice um, and engaging with them because a lot of parents are in flight or <laughs> fight or flight mode. Um, so they may not even be aware that their kiddo is at increased risk for substance use. And I can tell you from my experience, I wasn't until this topic got brought up. So utilizing that space to educate parents and help them to advocate for their kids um, is important as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michelle? My encouragement would be to get to know your school professionals. So make friends with your local school psychologist, school counselor, social workers. In Oklahoma, there's not a lot of those, but other states, their social workers are very prevalent in the schools. Um, those are going to be the people that speak a language similar to that in prevention and can then help you be connected with the things that are happening at the schools. I think you'd be surprised to find out that there's lots of things that prevention uh, professionals could plug into, could help make that connection to your coalitions that might expand the opportunities for school, family, and students. Excellent. And from a prevention standpoint, I just want to 
really remind everybody to treat adaptation as a process and don't be afraid of it. Start to look for those things that you think could work to address this problem. It is critical that we start to face it um, and then be bold in taking the lead on policy. This is what we do. Um, that part of sort of looking at the environment as the driver for behavior and um, the, the, the potential to be able to prevent it at the environmental level is a huge piece of, of what we do and where we can take the lead. Be proud of prevention and step into that lead role. And with that, I believe I will be handing it back over to Mr. Newby. As we close, I say again, thank you. And I ask you now, what strategies, approaches, or practices will you use when working with students with intellectual or emotional disabilities? Based upon what you've learned today, what's going on in your community, and what you feel that you are equipped to do. What strategies, approaches, or practices will you use when working with students with intellectual or emotional disabilities? Please put that in the chat. We'll be reviewing those uh, answers. Appreciate each and every one of you for attending. If you have any questions at this time, uh, you can put them in the chat as well. Uh, we will uh, review each of the questions that are received by us and we'll share them with our, with our speakers. And if those require an answer, we'll get those answers back to you when we send uh, our responses back to you as well with the slides. I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, we need your feedback. You can use the QR code right here on the screen or with your smartphone in order to scan it. Or you can use the link that's going to be placed in the chat to click on and do your evaluation. If for some reason you're not able to access it either of those ways, then when you sign off, you will get a, a prompt to complete the survey at that time as well. If you have any further questions after this event, you can contact me. I'm your TTA specialist for the South Southwest PTTC region, region six. My email address is dlnewby at ou.edu. When you receive these slides, they will have the references from today. Look forward to uh, you receiving those as well. These are also some resources that you'll receive a link to as well. Uh, maybe some some of you have seen these and maybe they are newer to others. But these are a few resources to support some skill building uh, around risk and protective factors and taking community-wide approaches to prevention.